Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin and our study of the book of Genesis. If you haven't seen the introductory videos, I recommend that you watch them first. But if you just want to jump into the text, that's what we're going to do today. But before that, I just realized that we all might be using different translations of the Bible. And that's actually a good thing. Yes, even in English, there are many translations of the Bible. But as anyone who speaks more than one language knows, it is almost impossible to translate anything word for word, especially when using expressions that don't really translate well. I don't think it means what you think it means. So moving from biblical Hebrew to English is not always easy, which is why seeing how various scholars translated the text can actually be helpful when understanding certain words and phrases. For reference, I am using the New American Bible because that's what I grew up with. But you might have in front of you the New American Standard Bible, or the King James Version, Christian Standard Bible, New International Version, the New Jerusalem Bible, New Revised Standard Version, or the old versions of those, the Good News Bible, or just about any version. And if you're not sure which translation you're using, that's okay too. I just wanted to note that because you might quickly notice that my text may vary slightly from yours, and that's okay. So... If you have your Bible with you, or if not, that's fine. I will actually read the verses uh, before going into talking about them. And so, well, let's go to the beginning. I'm going to start by reading Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. So as, we, as I like to begin before reading any scripture, just a prayer that God who inspired the scriptures will also inspire us. So I pray that the Spirit of God inspires this reading and study of the sacred word. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss, and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Evening came, and morning followed, the first day. Then God said, Let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. God made the dome, and it separated the water below the dome from the water above the dome. And so it happened. God called the dome sky. Evening came, and morning followed, the second day. Then God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered into a single basin, so that the dry land may appear. And so it happened that the water under the sky was gathered into its basin, and the dry land appeared. God called the dry land earth, and the basin of water he called sea. God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, every kind of plant that bears seed, and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. And so it happened. The earth brought forth vegetation, every kind of plant that bears seed, and every kind of fruit tree that bears fruit with its seed in it. God saw that it was good. Evening came, and morning followed, the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night. Let them mark the seasons, the days, and the years, and serve as lights in the dome of the sky to illuminate the earth. And so it happened. God made two great lights, the greater one to govern the day, and the lesser one to govern the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to illuminate the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. Evening came and morning followed, the fourth day. Then God said, Let the water teem with an abundance of living creatures, and on the earth let birds fly beneath the dome of the sky. God created the great sea monsters and all kinds of crawling, living creatures with which the water teems, and all kinds of winged birds. God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fertile, multiply, and fill the water of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, and morning followed, the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature, tame animals, crawling things, and every kind of wild animal. And so it happened. God made every kind of wild animal, every kind of tame animal, and every kind of thing that crawls on the ground. God saw that it was good. Then God said, 
Let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the seas, the birds of the air, the tame animals, all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that crawl on the earth. God also said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant on all the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it, to be your food. And to all the wild animals, all the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the earth, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything he had made and found it very good. Evening came and morning followed, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed, since on the seventh day God was finished with the work he had been doing. He rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work he had done in creation. Such is the story of the heavens and the earth at their creation. So this is known as the first creation story. And while similar to other Mesopotamian creation myths, there's some very important, unique details. Many creation stories begin with the divine struggling with the forces of chaos and eventually establishing order as they defeat the darkness. In contrast, these verses are rather peaceful. We see a God who is in control from the very beginning. The first two verses set it up. We will hear the story of how God created the heavens and the earth. So this is not really the story of the creation of the universe as much as it is about the creation of the earth and what can be seen from the earth, the heavens and the sky. At first, the earth was obscured. It was in darkness and without shape. The things that needed to be controlled were chaos, darkness, and water. Not as gods or entities as in other ancient cultures, but rather as the elements. All of these elements can be seen as hostile or scary, especially to a nomadic people in early times. We also see the first description of the power of God. In my translation, it says that a mighty wind was sweeping over the waters. But in Hebrew, the expression Ruach Elohim means the breath or spirit of God. So God is present even in the midst of these scary things. Then God speaks. His word creates. His word has power over all the elements. The dangerous, scary things are put in their place, but not destroyed. Light and darkness are separated, and God saw that light was good. This says a couple of things. The first is that what God creates is good. The second is that it sets up the theme of light and darkness kind of being symbols for good and evil. But the darkness is allowed to exist within creation. Then we have a refrain that is poetic, almost liturgical. It is a mnemonic device that allows these verses to be easily memorized and repeated. Evening came and morning followed, the first day. The separation of waters can be a bit confusing with the talk of domes of water above and below, but many ancient people believed that there was a reservoir of water in the sky from which the rain came. So the sky, or what was unknown to them about the composition of the atmosphere, can be seen as the upper dome. The lower dome was the earth, on which the water to be used for the oceans, lakes, and rivers remained. And then we have the refrain, evening came and morning followed, the second day. The third day separates the waters and allows the land to emerge. Like separating light from darkness, the seas and the land are separated with a word. But this time, both are considered good. Even though water can be scary and dangerous, it is now blessed by God. After all, Water is essential for life, and bodies of water are essential for any human settlement. But creation continues on this day as plants and vegetation are also created. Yet this passage is interesting. God didn't create each flower and tree in his workshop in heaven, like we see in some cartoons, and then plant it on the earth. Rather, he commanded the earth to bring forth vegetation. He's creating an ecosystem, a living world of plants that bear fruit and seeds. Fruit and seeds are important and repeated twice. There is a way in which the vegetation will sustain itself, and there is something that man will learn to cultivate.
and he saw that it was good. Evening came, and morning followed, the third day. Now we focus on the heavens. The lights in the dome of the sky separate the day and night. They will also be used to mark the seasons, days, and years. This shows that humanity would use the sun, moon, and stars to record the passing of time. Notice how we are told that two great lights are made, one for day and one for the night, and the stars. Yet they are not called the moon and sun, nor are any of the stars named. Yet earlier, God gives names to things like day and night, sky, earth, and sea. During the time when this is written, other people worship the moon and sun and other heavenly bodies. The names for these would have also been the names of those deities. Just as today, the names of the planets are the names of Roman gods. So they are not names so as not to give them any credibility or allow for any confusion as to who the one true God is. And yet, as natural bodies of light to illuminate the earth, they are considered good. Evening came, and morning followed, the fourth day. Now it's time for the animals. We'll start with the sea and the air. For remember, the skies are also considered to have contained water. But not just fish in the sea, but also sea monsters. Remember, the ocean is a scary place. There's always a bigger fish. But it is blessed by God. And like the plants, God makes it so the animals will be fertile and multiply. He's setting a world in motion with life. There's something unique and sacred about this life. And this will continue to be a theme later on. Evening came and morning followed. The fifth day. On the following day, God creates the land animals, wild, tame, and those that crawl on the ground. Interesting that the distinction between wild and tame would be made. But this shows that the Hebrew people would not only learn animal husbandry and domestication, but that some animals were meant to be tamed. It is also fascinating that as with the plants and the sea animals, God commands the earth to bring forth the animals. There's a sense of relationship between the land and animals, the land and life. The earth is growing and developing, still at God's command, but in a natural way. And of course, God saw that this was good. Then God creates human beings. Verse 26 through 31 have a lot to be unpacked. First, we have this interesting grammatical change in number. God said, let us make. Wait, who else is up there with God? Some Jewish scholars would attribute this to what is often called the plurality of majesty, or the royal we. This is seen in other passages and language of God and kings in the Bible. Often, one in authority would use such language to refer to the totality of power and authority. Another interpretation which is also referenced later in some other passages, such as in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, is that God is speaking with his heavenly court of angelic beings. Now, we haven't heard about God's heavenly court up to this point, but it was a widely held belief at the time. Modeling humility, God confers with the angels and includes them in the creation of man. Finally, Christian theologians have long held that this is an allusion to the Trinitarian nature of God and that God the Father is speaking with the Son and the Holy Spirit. The author at this time would have no knowledge of such an understanding, but this would be revealed later. Then God briefly describes his intentions for this new creation, which in this context is the creation of both man and woman together, which is clearly stated in the next verse. First, they are created in the image and likeness of God. There has been much written about this, but at its core, it is that we are created as good, with an inherent dignity. God goes on to say that we are to be the height of creation, having a special place over the animals of the earth. We will have authority as God does over lesser beings. Later, we find out that we will also have moral agency, although that comes with consequences. While verse 26 explained what God would do, in verse 27, God does it. This also presents another theme in the Bible. God makes a promise, and then he fulfills it. As with the animals, God blesses the humans in the next verse and also gives them the command to be fertile and multiply. Also, again, reminding them that they will have control of the animals of the sea, air, and earth. And here's another fun fact. The first humans, and it sounds like animals too, were vegetarians or herbivores. In verse 29, he gives them the seed-bearing plants, vegetables, and seed-bearing fruits to be their food. To the animals, he gives all the other green plants. For those who are vegetarians, you're in good company, as this was the proper diet for humans as God originally intended. For those who aren't, don't worry. Later, he tells us that we can eat meat. But this garden was peaceful in every way. So 
man didn't kill the animals. They all lived in harmony. And in fact, after creating humans, God doesn't just proclaim that it was good, but rather God looked at everything he had made and he found it very good. Evening came and morning followed, the sixth day. This ends the refrains of each day, concluding the work of creation. We are told that the creation of the heavens and the earth are completed. We have seen that God created it to be an ecosystem that can sustain itself. So while he would still be involved, God is not actively creating new things at this point. We are also told that the world was completed and that God rested on the seventh day. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Although the institution of the Sabbath would occur much later when God makes a covenant with the Israelites, we are told that it was already blessed and made holy from the very beginning. You see, God had a plan from the start. And so before concluding today, I'd like to address something that can be a touchy subject for many. One question that comes up a lot among Christians is whether or not the creation account is literal, which brings up all sorts of questions about theories of the Big Bang, evolution, or even the age of the earth. In short, such arguments end up creating this chasm between faith and science, which I don't think ends up being very helpful. And there are three basic ways that believers tend to look at creation stories as part of the first 11 chapters of Genesis that we will continue to explore. And each have their proponents. Regardless of which one you ascribe to, it is still possible to retain all of the theological and inspirational implications of these texts, which I think is the foundation of what this channel is all about. First, there is the fundamentalist view. There are those who believe in a literal interpretation of scripture and would typically discount much of what science would say that would challenge such a worldview. Your eyes can deceive you, don't trust them. Much of what we might believe from paleontology, archeology, span anthropology, or astronomy, and physics that contradict the ancient worldview would be considered obstacles or even traps that could lead us away from our faith. For some, this is not a big issue and life can be lived without ever worrying about what anyone else thinks or believes. And that's great. For others, this can be a constant battle and even cause them to lose faith if such a worldview is challenged too much. Either way, it is certainly a view held by many Christians. The other extreme would be to view the section of Genesis as purely mythological stories that are no different than similar stories from the surrounding cultures of the time. You don't believe in the force, do you? That's one way of putting it. They see them as a retelling of other creation myths that are changed enough to set up a foundation and themes from which the rest of the Bible can build upon. There's no conflict with science because they are not meant to be scientific or historical accounts of the beginning of time. Problems or conflicts of faith might arise under this view when such an interpretation is telescoped to other stories of the Bible that might seem beyond the possibility of science, like stories of miracles even. Do we just assert them to be symbolic as well? However, many believers do hold this view and still see the theological and inspirational themes of these texts to be true, namely that creation was still planned and executed by God. The third view is somewhere in between, and the one that I personally subscribe to. As mentioned in the introduction to this channel, I do acknowledge that these stories are true, but also mythological in nature. So what I told you was true from a certain point of view. Sure. We are talking about things that even today we are still struggling to understand. How could someone thousands of years ago describe the beginning of creation? God inspires in truth, but the biblical authors write in a way that they understand, in a language that evokes awe and wonder for a God that is not understandable. I believe that faith and science can and should be partners instead of rivals. From your point of view. It is. So let's look again at the creation story in relation to what scientists believe about the beginning. In Genesis, the point of view is from the earth, because that's what is known. Yet it still begins with an abyss of darkness without form or shape. How might we describe the universe before the Big Bang, or whatever we're calling it now? The first act is the creation of light, which separates the darkness. Then we look to the creation of the earth. We see this from the perspective of someone on the earth. We have what are described as domes. We might call them the surface of the earth and the atmosphere. God separates the elements, then, then air, water, and land emerge on the planet. We know that water is essential for life, and plant life is created next. From the point of view of the earth, smoke and dust would eventually settle, and the sun, moon, and stars would become visible, and seasons would begin. And then animal life emerges, first in the oceans, and not on land until the next act of creation. Finally, God would breathe life into human beings, 
giving them a sentience not known among the other animals. I see no contradiction between this and most of modern science. But what about the timeline? Six, seven days? For many, that's a sticking point, but I don't see it that way. Numbers are very symbolic in the Bible. They're very important. Remember, we're talking about a God of order. Numbers like 7, 10, and 40 have different meanings. At any rate, we talked about how this sets up the appropriate number of days for work and the importance of the Sabbath. It's a day of rest that is hardwired into creation itself. But these six days occurred before humanity. There was no one to keep track with this construct that we call time, and God's time is not like our time. Psalm 90 verse 4 says, A thousand years in your eyes are merely a day gone by. And to say a thousand years was really just a way of saying a very long time that's hard to imagine. A day made sense for the narrative, acted as a great literary device, and set up the importance of the Sabbath. It also shows that God has a plan and an order to that plan. If you're okay with viewing a day as an epoch or a great length of time, then the creation story is pretty spot on. Of course, other similar questions will continue as we read the Bible. But for me, trying to get into the perspective of the authors and their worldview can help make sense of some of the more mythic elements in the scripture and appreciate the revelation of God as a living word that continues to speak in new and marvelous ways. As we explored this first chapter of Genesis, we used a bit of the historical and theological approaches. But what about the inspirational? What does this mean for readers today? To begin with, I think we can be comforted with the idea that God has a plan and that he follows through with it. This may sound simple, but it's not always felt, especially when it seems like everything is falling apart. It helps us to remember that ultimately God is in charge, even in the midst of chaos and darkness. God is there, sometimes silently, sometimes like a mighty wind. And we don't always know his plan. In fact, we rarely do, but each day could bring something new. Another truth that can be found in these passages is that what God makes is good, and human beings are very good. Many, if you're old like me, might have grown up with the phrase, God don't make junk. And that's true. Each person is wondrously and marvelously made, which brings us to the point about being made in God's image and likeness. The dignity that we have as the height of God's creation is unmatched. We have a dignity that cannot be earned or lost. It's simply by nature of our existence as human beings being blessed by God. And hopefully that can inspire us as to how we see other human beings. When thinking about what it means to be created in the likeness of God, I'm reminded by a quote by one of my favorite authors. In his book, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis writes, There are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. In their life to is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play. But our merriment must be of that kind, and it is, in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. I do hope that you will join me next time as we look at the next couple of chapters in Genesis. Until then, enjoy creation and do good.